Thank you for joining The Right Dose. We will take a trip through the science behind pesticide use in Florida agriculture. Our goal is to educate pesticide applicators and the public in the critical areas of integrated pest management according to Florida regulations. So, sit back, relax, and put your learning hat on as we discuss the right dose and how we can possibly impact our environment, our economy, and our communities. Welcome back to another episode of The Right Dose. My name is Jonah Bosquez, Hardy County Extension Agent. I am joined today by Mrs. Eija Paulello. She's our multi-county citrus agent. We have Luis Rodriguez, he's a Polk County Ag Agent and Small Farms Agent and Pesticide Licensing Agent, etc. And we have today Lourdes Perez. She's our new Islands County agriculture agent and she's going to be working with pesticide management and licensing and all that good stuff and today we're going to be talking about chapter four which is understanding pesticide formulations why is this important we have different formulations that are designed to meet the a specific requirement in terms of equipment and application that is why we need to understand them to match them to the right application uh, equipment. So let's start with formulations. What are they? Can you talk a bit about, you know, formulations as a whole? What type of formulations we have, etc. Yes. Uh, so there are uh, different types of, of formulations. One of the most commons are going to be your liquid formulations, and after that you also have solid formulations, which are the most common that all pesticide applicators may be using one day or another during their uh, time as pesticide applicators. Also, we got some uh, formulations that are not considered either liquid or solid. There's something in between. And those are the ones that we're gonna be talking about. So let's let's talk about those formulations. Let's first go into the liquid formulations. What type of liquid formulation do we have? So the first two I want to talk about are the emulsions. We got two types of emulsions. We got the normal emulsions, and then we got the inverted emulsions. Basically, an emulsion is something similar to milk. Uh, the emulsion is a water solution that has a oil-based active ingredient within that water solution. Uh, the inverse emulsion will be then the opposite. You will have an oil solution and then the active ingredient is going to be water-based. Uh, basically, those are most of the most common uh, solutions that pesticide applicators use in order to use in their sprayers or the boom sprayers or something that they're going to be applying liquid and in a liquid base. Okay, awesome. What else do we have in the liquid category? So we have some of these ready to use low concentration solutions. And a lot of that's gonna be things that are gonna be available in retail stores, more for homeowner use. Um, again, they're very low concentrations um, that you would spray around your home for pest control. They're going to most likely not have to be diluted. So they're not gonna be in a concentrated form. They're ready to use. They may have a spray nozzle attached to them already. Um, another form that they could be in is going to be those aerosol cans. Of course, those are ready to use. They're easy to store and transport. And um, also some liquid baits that you may place around your home, say for maybe roaches or something like that. And then also there are some liquid baits that can be placed in traps that we may use in agriculture to monitor some populations. Okay. And then we have some more categories in there. Can you talk about those, Lourdes? Yeah, so the ones that I will be talking about are going to be the solution. So basically a solution is just a mi mixture of substances that are soluble with each other. This basically do not separate and they usually contain the active ingredient, the carrier, and it may contain one or more other ingredients. Um, the next category that I will be talking about are going to be the flowable and liquids. So this one's combined characteristics of emulsible concentrates and wettable powders, which we will be talking about later on. Um, but basically they are used when the active ingredient is a solid that does not dissolve in water or in oil. Awesome. 
So we have one last category. Another formulation that we use a lot in agriculture or possibly even mosquito control is going to be ultra low volume. Now what that is, is that's going to be in more of a fog or mist type application. You're going to be needing some specialized equipment for that. It produces some very fine droplets. So we do have to be mindful of any drift that could occur with this type of application. And usually almost all of the time, it's going to be close to 100% active ingredients. So it is highly concentrated. So now let's go into the solid state. Okay, what solid formulations do we have? So the first thing I wanna be talking about here in uh, solid formulation are dusk. Uh, those are very common for ant control. You may find a dust in any other store and you just basically uh, spread the dust in, in those ant mounds. So that's an uh, sample about the dusk. Uh, and that's basically what it is. It's just a dust that you just basically spray around mm -hmm. to control that pest. Uh, then you got your weather powders and your solid powders, which is basically uh, those like solution that you uh, combine with water and then you can actually use that with sprayers or boom sprayers. Uh, the difference between the wettable powders and the soluble powders is that the wettable powders will not uh, mix all together uh, with the water solution and you need to agitate them constantly. In the case of the soluble powders, they should dissolve completely in that water solution and they don't need any kind of agitation. Another type of solid formulation is going to be granules. Uh, these are normally ready to use, don't, aren't diluted in any kind of carrier um, as water or such like that. They are larger particles and they can be non-uniform in size. So there can be different sizes which can make them difficult to spread depending on the application equipment that you're using. Normally with this, some water is needed to release the chemical from the granules. Uh, another type of solid formulation is going to be pellets. Now those are going to be uniform in size, so that makes it a little bit easier to apply with certain equipment. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with pellets is that they could possibly be in a fumigation uh, chemical in them. So know the difference between a pellet that just gets applied and one that's actually needed for fumigation. We also have something called the water dispersible granules. Uh, what that is, is very, very small granule particles. They have to be mixed in water. Uh, that's going to require constant agitation, so you need to have that available on your um, equipment. And they act much like wettable powders. They're, they're easily measured and mixed, and because of the particle size, they have less of an inhalation risk um, associated with the mixer. Yeah, let, let me make a, a parenthesis here. This is one of the most technical chapters in the book, but we're going to make, try to make it fun for you. <laughs> Lourdes, uh, what are baits, which are solid uh, formulations as well? Yeah, so baits is very simple. It's just a low amounts of active ingredients that are mixed with food. Like rat poison. Exactly. Yeah. Candy and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so let's go into the formulations that are not solid and are not liquid because this a variety of products gets really complicated. Yeah, we come in the gray area of the formulations that is difficult to determine if they are actually liquid or solid because they share some characteristics between the two of them. So the first thing I want to talk about is going to be the attractants, which is something very similar about what Aja just spoke a little um, early today about those liquid baits. But these ones are actual pheromones and basically we call, put these different traps with different pheromones inside them and we can actually use them to trap, kill pests and that way we can actually monitor the population of those pests around the agricultural area. And the other thing that I want to talk about is the animal systemic pesticides which basically this is going to be that pesticide that you apply directly into the skin of the animal and it's gonna be absorbed, and then if a pest get inside and get into that skin, then the pest is gonna die. An example of this is gonna be your normal uh, front line for your pet store that you can actually apply to your cats or your dogs. That's basically what it is, a animal systemic pesticide. And we do have like injectables as well in that systemic pesticide category. Yes. 
Okay, the next one I wanted to um, talk about is gonna be fumigation or fumigants, right? So that's gonna be something that is applied to an enclosed space. You know, we've all seen those tented homes or buildings that they're doing for termites. Um, also, when you're seeing some row crops in the field that utilize plastic, they fumigate that soil underneath prior to planting. Um, and that fumigates, fumigants are in their own special category, so they re require some special certification and um, training because they are highly toxic. Mm -hmm. Two other formulations that are used with highly toxic materials is going to be the first one is micro-encapsulated materials. These are going to be much like a controlled release fertilizer type uh, concept where the pesticide um, particles are covered in a plastic coating. And what that does first, it protects the, the applicator, the mixer and the loader from the highly toxic chemical because it is covered. Um, and as the plastic coating breaks down in the environment, the pesticide is released slowly. Uh, precaution with this is going to be um, bees. They tend to think that these could be pollen grains because they are so small. So make sure you take extra caution if you know there are bees foraging in the area when you use a product like this. The second one is going to be a water soluble packet and many of you may have used this already. Um, it's a lot like the um, what you would put like in your dishwasher and your in your like Tide Pods. Like Tide Pods, exactly. We remember Tide Pods by the mm -hmm. Tide Pod Challenge, right? Oh gosh. <laughs> well this what you have is the um, the water soluble packet. So the pesticide is inside this this bag that you literally just are gonna throw into your spray tank and the bag will dissolve. So it, it again protects the mixer and loader from this pesticide um, just to Cut down on that exposure risk. Okay, and it's probably easier to handle than just in, with the formulation. Correct. Yep. Okay. yep, absolutely. What else do we have on the gray category of non solid, no liquid? Yeah, we also have repellents and impregnable products. So basically, repellents um, refer to insect repellents like the ones that we use when you're going hiking. These ones are all available in aerosol and also in lotion form and you can mix them, you can put them in your skin, etc. And impregnable products, um, they're basically products that are going to be impregnated in the collars of animals um, and livestock, ear tags, plastic pest strips, etc. And with time, they're going to evaporate and that's what's going to cause that um, repellent um, effect. Okay, what is an adjuvant? Right, so the first thing I want to explain about adjuvants, uh, whenever we look at that label, we're going to always see the active ingredient and right after the logo as ingredient, you're going to see something that says uh, inner ingredients. So most of that formulation of inner ingredients, some of them may carry these adjuvants. And these adjuvants is basically uh, other solutions, other chemicals that will increase the effectiveness of this uh, pesticide. For example, we got some adjuvants that are surfactant that basically help that uh, increase that tension in the pesticide in the plant so the pesticide actually remains in that plant and doesn't just uh, drip out of the plant. Then we got some buffers that some pesticides don't work really well on um, very basic water and here in Florida we got a lot of different basic uh, water sources. So it's good to add some buffers into this pesticide in order to make that pesticide do not lose their effective power or their effective control for that pest. And also, we got something that is called emulsifying agents that is mostly for emulsions and this helps that combination of that water phase with that oil phase. Remember that water doesn't mix good with oil, so these emulsifying agents will help that solution to maintain stable. So, juvens are our friends. Yes. Okay, awesome. So the last uh, thing that we have to discuss in this chapter is going to be mixing different pesticides. Um, can we talk about that? How we do it? How do we ensure that they mix together and they stay safe and we're applying them in the right way? Right? right, so many of us are very used to applying multiple pesticides or even putting fertilizer, um, liquid fertilizer or 
uh, nutritional sprays into the spray tank, right? Because we know every run through the field or through the grove costs money. Um, but there is a precaution to be taken with some of this. Um, it, it is important to know if the pesticides are compatible together or with those other chemicals that you may be adding to your spray tank. So the one way to be able to do this is to do what's called a jar test. And you're basically testing to see what the compatibility is going to be because we would rather have this happen in a small jar than in a 500 gallon spray tank, right? Uh, so you, you're gonna take the chemicals that you plan on mixing in your spray tank and add them to the jar in the same relative amounts that you would be doing in your in your spray tank. Um, and you're gonna let you're gonna agitate it if it's some a formulation that needs agitation. You're gonna see how that combines and sets. If you have any kind of settling out, if you have some flaking, uh, clumping, anything that kind of turns to a gelatinous type phase, um, or you can even be mindful of any kind of chemical reaction that may be happening, such as uh, release of heat or cold. You may want to test the pH of the solution because a lot of time that affects the uh, efficacy of the pesticides. And you can have two tests together if you'd like to, one that maybe has the adjuvant to see if maybe the adjuvant would help, like what, one of the ones like Luis was talking about, the buffer or something like that. Um, just to kind of really get a, a true test of how those those chemicals are going to act before you spend the money and have that go into your spray tank. Awesome. In conclusion, Chapter 4 gives us a, a wide variety of formulations that we may encounter when we're doing our application. Uh, or before we are doing that application, we're doing a selection of the right pesticide for the right job. Always read that label. That label is going to give us the information that we need to correctly apply this, this pesticide that, that we have and get the job done. Um, the other thing that, that we were commenting was on the fact that the trade name usually has some letters attached to it. Those letters are going to give us some idea on what type of formulation we are dealing with so we can further study that label and find the recommendations on what equipment we are going to need. Why is this important to apply the, the, the pesticide with the right equipment? For example, uh, some formulations, for example, may be abrasive, uh, like wetable powders, uh, and most of the hazard formulations that doesn't uh, settle correctly or doesn't mix completely, then they could be abrasive. And it's important for us to actually use an equipment that is not as uh, doesn't uh, get damaged so quickly with abrasive products. So, AJ talked a little bit about that on on, on that ingredient being a chance that that ingredient is going to precipitate and create some type of solid uh, material that may damage the equipment, affecting the rate of, of, of application. So in order for us to understand all of that, we have to read that label. So finally, the, the last piece of advice that we can get from this uh, studying this chapter is that you have a lot of questions that may arise call your local extension agent here. You have four of them. You have Highlands County, you have Hardy County, you have Polk County, you have DeSoto County, and you do Manatee County and as Manatee well. as well. So uh, in South Central Florida, we have a team of extension agents that are trained in pesticide handling that can help you. Remember, contact us. And this is the conclusion of chapter four of The Right Dose. See you later. Brands or trade names mentioned in this episode were used under the intention to provide education and not for marketing or promotional purposes. Mm -hmm.